those of you that are new to the company, I'm Garish Jindia, CEO and President of the company. I wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us today at our public health town hall meeting. As with our last town hall back in January of this year, we will record this session so that those of you that are not able to make it today can still have access to the information regarding the importance of what our public health team imparts during this session. This is the same information that our public health team advises to our own customers. Therefore, we felt it was crucial to share this with our own team and personnel. We certainly encourage all of you to share this town hall recording with your family, friends, and members in your network that need to do all our part to stay responsible and stay safe during this pandemic. For this town hall, I'd like to welcome back members of our public health team, Dr. Till Jolly, Dr. Emily Lankow, and Dr. Deidre Parrish. The COVID-19 situation changes daily, and our team has the latest information to share, uh, as there have been important developments with regards to vaccines, new variants of COVID-19, and it's really important to remain healthy and safe as states begin to reopen and lift restrictions around the country. At the end of this session, we will host a question and answer period following our presenters' updates to ensure your questions and concerns are appropriately addressed. I know we are all interested in learning about the latest COVID-19 guidance and surrounding impacts. So we will get right to it. With that said, I now turn the presentation over to our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Till Jolly. Till? Good afternoon and, and good morning to some of you. Thanks, thanks, Garish. Um, and, and thanks to everybody for putting this together and for, for calling in today. This is obviously, this is a continuation of a series we've done. Um, for our employee base. And, and as Garish said, we do this frequently and have frequent discussions with our client base. Um, and But it's very important to communicate to you what's going on and what the latest information is, and most importantly, to answer your questions. So we'll probably spend more time on Q&A than we will on presentations. Um, the current situation um, you know, continues to change daily, as Garish has said. We, I did two town hall presentations for clients last week. Between the first and the second one, there were news changes I had to address in the second one. And between last week and today, there have been more, more uh, news, uh, news uh, discussions and things that we need to discuss. And so in a changing landscape. The, the really good news now is, is about vaccines and, and, and a great scientific achievement. And many folks at Aveshka um, have been involved in those things. And so you're to be congratulated for your work. This, the vaccine story is going to end up being a very good story. But with this, this solid uh, good news, there also is, is area for concern. And we're going to talk about all of this today. Um, we see still some inconsistency among the states and in, in their rules and regulations. Um, and we are carefully watching the numbers, which you're going to hear about. We can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow or 10 days now or two months from now, but we can tell you that we need to remain vigilant and, and work very hard at this. And so we'll continue to serve our clients as an Aveshka team, but we also want to make sure that you have have the opportunity to get the, the latest information and the latest insights from us. So with that said, I'm gonna you're gonna hear from two people. Uh, Dr. Lankow is gonna talk a bit about um, the data and what it's telling us. But first I'm gonna turn it to Dr. Deidre Parrish, um, one of our infectious disease specialists and really a key part of our team, who's gonna talk a bit about vaccines and variants and mutations and and the science behind those and and try to clear up some of the things you're hearing. So, Deidre, I'm going to turn it to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Till. So, as many of you are aware, and as um, Dr. Lankow later will um, will show, 
Um, the COVID-19 case rates across the country and, and the world have been dropping steeply, um, but there's been some um, beginnings of a plateau um, in those case rates, and, and a lot of that is largely due to variants. So I'm going to share my screen and, um, and highlight a couple of um, variants of concern. So since the last time we talked, you know, there's there's been more um, more variants and more activity um, on um, studying some of the variants. Um, as you recall, variant um, cases of COVID-19 are mutated versions of the virus. Um, and so at this point, we have both imported and homegrown variants um, that are circulating. Um, so the one of the first variants that was identified, the B117 from the UK, uh, is on track to become the dominant variant in the US by the end of this month. Um, all of these variants are more transmissible, meaning they can spread more easily than the regular wild type virus. And this UK variant has recently been shown to be associated with increased deaths in the UK. Um, some of those studies are ongoing and, and they'll need to be further studies to corroborate that. Um, so, so that does remain a concern. The good news for the UK variant is that the vaccines that are currently in production and in use um, remain effective for this variant. And so when we're talking about um, the variant from South Africa, the B1351, and the variant from Brazil, the P1, those are of particular concern because um, these do seem to decrease the vaccine effectiveness. Um, some of this is dependent on the vaccine, and of course, there's the studies are ongoing in some of these. More recently, California has uh, identified a couple of related variants which have accounted for their most recent surge in Southern California. Um, there's still more to be learned about, um, about these variants, but um, they have already spread to, um, to several other countries as well. And then lastly, uh, more recently, New York City has identified a variant um, that is increasingly seen in the city. Um, the concern about this is that it does have some similarities to the B131351, the South African variant, as well as the P1 Brazil variant. So um, there will be more to come on that. So as you can imagine, the effectively we're in a race um, to vaccinate so that we can reduce transmission to prevent or to decrease or halt the spread of these variants, as well as to prevent the emergence of new variants. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about vaccines next. So to date, there have been about 72 million Americans that have received at least one dose of vaccine, with about 39 million fully vaccinated. Um, that's about 11.8% of the population, and that's excellent. And, um, and vaccination continues to increase. You know, states are progressing in their vaccination phases with a goal of opening up vaccination to all adults by May 1st. So that is all great news, as, as Till yeah. mentioned. So the first vaccines out of the gate um, were the Pfizer and Moderna, which you've heard so much about and which have been in use for a few months now. Um, these are the ones we um, are most familiar with. Um, these both are M mRNA vaccines, highly efficacious. Um, they require um, frozen storage with F Pfizer requiring the ultra cold. Um, both of these vaccines are two dose vaccines. And the main difference between them is that the Pfizer is actually indicated for those 16 years and older, while the Moderna is indicated for those 18 years and older. Um, in terms of their effectiveness against the variants, um, they both seem to um, work 
against the UK variant, the B117, but with likely reduced efficacy against some of the other variants, including the South African variant. So, so studies are ongoing related to that. Um, the most recent vaccine that has been authorized for use in the US is the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, otherwise known as the J&J &J vaccine. So this vaccine is different structurally from the other two because it, um, it's not an mRNA vaccine. It uses a viral vector, which basically um, is the vehicle that carries the antigen into the, to the person's immune system. So it's structured a little bit differently. Um, when we talk about efficacy of the J&J &J vaccine, it does require a little bit of discussion because at a glance, it looks like this vaccine is not as efficacious as the others. However, the J&J &J vaccine conducted its phase three trials later than the other two vaccines and during the time that a lot of these variants were circulating. In fact, the J&J &J vaccine had phase three studies in South Africa during the time that the um, variant was circulating there and also in Brazil during the time that the P1 um, variant was circulating there. So from its phase three studies, the overall effic efficacy was 66%. If you look only at the US, the efficacy increased to 74%. And then if you actually looked at severe disease, including COVID-19 hospitalization, the efficacy was even higher at 86%. Um, so the bottom line and what you've you know, heard from, um, you know, from medical experts as, the, uh, as this vaccine was, um, was authorized is that this is an effective vaccine. Um, use it take it if you have access to it. Yeah, it is effective. The main benefit of the J&J &J vaccine, well, a couple of them, are that it's, it only requires refrigeration for storage and it is one dose. And that is, that is crucial in terms of getting uh, a larger number of people vaccinated. So effectively with half of the effort you can vaccinate, you know, the same number of people. The one dose uh, option is also great for pop-up vaccination pods, vaccination clinics, um, mobile vaccination, and also reaching hard to reach populations. So the, um, in terms of the effectiveness against variants, you know, as kind of uh, noted in its overall efficacy, during the time the variants were circulating, you can see that, uh, that the J&J &J vaccine is, is thought to be less effective against the, um, the South African and the uh, Brazil variant. So for example, in the phase three studies in South Africa, at the time, about 95% of the South African COVID-19 cases were caused by that one B1135 variant. Um, and the overall efficacy for, of the J&J &J vaccine in South Africa was about 52%. So, so it did have um, decreased effectiveness, um, again, which reinforces the need for us to, as Till said, to stay vigilant, to, to continue all of the um, preventive things that we're doing to get vaccinated when it is our turn and we have, uh, we're eligible to get vaccinated and, you know, to stay the course um, so that we can, you know, come out on the other end of this. So before I turn it over to Dr. Langkow, I did want to um, speak just briefly about the AstraZeneca vaccine. So I don't have this on my slides, but the, um, you probably have heard about the, the AstraZeneca vaccine from uh, the media and the what what is um, so the AstraZeneca vaccine is not currently authorized in the U.S. Even though there are plans for it to receive authorization, but it is authorized in Europe and the U.K. where it's been used widely. 
Um, and so what you've probably heard about or read about in the news is that several or many now European countries have halted vaccination with the AstraZeneca vaccine because of blood clots in some people who have received the vaccine. So to be clear, there is a, a bit of a conflict between you know, these actions of stopping the rollout of this vaccine and the scientific and medical communities in Europe and the UK. Um, what was found was about 30 cases of blood clots in about 17 million people vaccinated. And both the European Medicines Agency as well as you know, AstraZeneca, um, the company, you know, um, indicate that the, the rate of those blood clots is actually um, similar to or less than the expected rate of blood clots in the population. So there's no indication, according to um, the European Medi Medicines Agency, that there is a there's a actual link or that the vaccine is causing these blood clots. So this has been a bit problematic. I, I know that the that agency is going to come out with a, an official recommendation probably later this week. Um, however, because vaccination was halted in some of these countries, that just feeds into some vaccine hesitancy um, that is already prevalent in a lot of European countries and that might carry over into other um, regions of the world as AstraZeneca um, is approved in different places. So, um, so that's a concern that, that we'll continue to follow. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Lankow. Thank you, Dr. Parrish. Um, so I'm going to pull up some websites and drive us through some of the data uh, just to give folks a picture of where we are right now. So you should now see a map of the world. Uh, this is our world in data where we go for our international look when we're looking for clients. Um, I want to point out that we've seen a lot of improvements. It's nice to start with some good messages. There are locations in Europe and South America that are still struggling. The U.S. is still coming down from a pretty high peak. Um, but we are seeing global improvements uh, in COVID case counts right now, and that's a really exciting thing to see after such a significant outbreak globally um, through the holiday season. We're going to zoom into the U.S. now. So this is one of our favorite sites, COVID Case Mapper, um, that's run off the New York Times aggregate data. And COVID Case Mapper is also showing those improvements at a county level. So the scale bar down here has been moving steadily away from really high case counts in these dark red colors to moving towards a median of about 150, um, which is closer to where we were in the fall. Uh, I wanna point out two states, just so that you're aware, there was a very large case dump from uh, Missouri as part of their antigen testing. They changed their standards for what they reported. So these case counts in Missouri are probably not reflective of the current outbreak, but are reflective of a large influx of cases that had not previously been reported. And Iowa has changed their reporting and currently is reporting only at the state level. And um, hopefully that will resolve shortly. So if you're looking at this map and see those two states looking a little different from the rest of the country, it's a reporting issue. That's a good uh, place to point out how hard our public health departments across the country have been working. This has been a really, really difficult outbreak. Um, huge data systems have had to be stood up in order to report these cases. And sometimes there have been hiccups along the way that affect reporting. So keep an eye on Iowa and Missouri. Those should resolve shortly as, as their new reporting standards get straightened out. Across the country, we're seeing really good improvements, a lot more light colored counties, fewer dark, although we do still see some significant outbreaks going on, especially in the southeastern part of the United States. I'm gonna scroll down here and show you the overall epi curve. And again, in September, when this outbreak started, we were here. We're just now settling into a national picture that looks a little more like where we were in September. I also wanna point out the stall that Dr. Parrish had, had, had alluded to. We were coming down pretty significantly through the end of the holiday season, and we have seen this sort of plateauing that CDC has been quite concerned about that may suggest that there are changes in transmission, either through behavioral changes or these new variants that is slowing down our decline towards low case counts. And it's something to watch very, very closely. I'm gonna show you two states that sort of reflect what we're seeing nationally. 
In California, there have been some really substantial outbreaks, and I focused in on L.A. because L.A. County had some really serious outbreaks and difficulties with hospital capacity, um, particularly through the holiday season. Now most of California has come down to much more or to lower more reasonable case counts that might allow folks to consider getting out and about. But California has been very, very slow to move people towards getting out into the community. And they have a tier system for allowing counties to reopen. If we scroll down and look at their case counts, they're continuing to come down at a fairly steady rate. Although we see a slowing in that decline, they're continuing to decline. Another state that we've been watching closely, particularly because of the recent weather patterns that affected reporting and capacity to get folks to care, um, is Texas. And in Texas, we still see very, very high case counts. We're zoomed in on Harris County, which is the Houston area. And those high case counts are reflective of continued transmission and variants have been detected in the Houston area that may also be playing into this as well as changes in behavior due to recent changes in state policy, lifting of mask ordinances and reopening of businesses. If we scroll down and look at their case counts, they've had quite a bit of variability. Some of that flux is probably due to weather patterns, um, but they are seeing a much slower decline and a more variable decline that may reflect both variants and changes in behavior that have been occurring in that area. I want to point you to another website that we really like, COVID Act Now. So for our clients, we not only monitor case counts, but we monitor a number of ancillary data points that help us interpret those case counts in context. And COVID Act Now uses the same data source as we do and visualizes those data both as a risk map that shows us again, light colors moving towards green are what we're looking for. Darker red tells us a more severe risk of an outbreak. And we are seeing more and more counties coming into that yellow and orange area that says that these outbreaks are, are simmering and slowing down at least, which is a good thing to see. Some of the variables that we monitor are very similar to what is shown on COVID Act now. So it's a great resource for folks who are trying to look and see how things are going. We look at daily case counts. We also look at 14 day case rates. We look at positive test rate to get a sense of how deeply each state is testing to understand if those case counts are reflective of the current situation. We look at hospital capacity and hospitalization trends, and we are monitoring vaccination trends. Although we haven't incorporated those into our decision tools at this time, it is something we keep an eye on. I also want to point to the new metric that they've put on this site, which I think is so critical for understanding health equity and how to roll out vaccine appropriately. There's now a vulnerability index that looks at the vulnerable populations in a state who are most at risk of COVID um, and for COVID deaths because of the situation, the social dynamics and social determinants of health in which they live. Um, so do take a look at that vulnerability index. It takes into account things like ability to access health care, um, ability to speak English and get access to care through, through the English language, um, also poverty um, and other access points that would make health care very difficult. So something that's you know vital to look at to make sure that we're getting vaccine to people who need it most. As Dr. Parrish said, vaccines are coming um, and that's really exciting to see, but variants are also out there. And so we continue to tell our clients and encourage you all as well to use multiple layers of protection to reduce transmission, to give us time to get people vaccinated and reduce the likelihood of more variants coming out that could affect our ability to control this disease. I think we've shown this before in a town hall, but this Swiss cheese model of prevention is really important, especially right now. As things improve, the impulse is to let up. And in fact, we need to double down on prevention efforts to give ourselves time to get everyone vaccinated. Um, so there are all these personal responsibilities, staying home if you can, only going out for essential trips and services, using appropriate hygiene, wearing a mask, trying to limit your contact with people in crowded spaces where you can have transmission events, using good ventilation when you do need to be in spaces where you have to interact with other people, and then quarantine testing and isolation of those who have been exposed or, or are sick. You'll notice that in this diagram, vaccination is the final piece of cheese. It's not the first one. Um, so right now it's really critical that we continue to adhere to all of these prevention strategies to protect our vulnerable populations until they are vaccinated. I do want to give you some good news. So we do have really good data now that masks decrease transmission and staying out of areas with high, high density uh, interactions with other people like restaurants can also decrease transmission. And so, you know, the CDC has had some time now with this disease. They've been able to do that analysis and wearing masks protects us and trying to avoid large events is still a protective thing that we need to be doing. 
And finally, some good news on the vaccine front. We are seeing data that suggests that as folks get vaccinated, we are seeing a reduction in severe disease and deaths. And that is really important data to know that vaccines are doing what we really need them to do. The critical part is to stop people from dying from this disease. This graph shows us that as we move into a, a period where people are vaccinated, that we're seeing decreases in deaths in long-term care facilities as we get those populations covered with vaccine. Other good news we're hearing out of Israel is that these vaccines may also be affecting population level dynamics. And so we are seeing suggestions in, in Israel's data that getting folks vaccinated to a high enough level, and it looks like 70 to 80 percent for them, also decreases transmission generally in the population. And that's the hope that these vaccines will also do that and get us to a place where this, this virus is controllable. It may still be with us for a long time, but is not at the levels that we've been seeing. Um, I will gather all these websites and send them to Carissa so they can be sent out if folks want to explore them in uh, greater detail. And I'm going to pass it back to Till. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lakow and Dr. Parrish. This is outstanding information and really important um, for, for everybody to hear. So now we're going to take take questions. Uh, Carissa is going to manage the question flow. We're already getting some interesting ones in the chat. Um, and we're certainly, you know, I, I don't know. I also let Chris manage the time. We go over to answer some questions. That's great. That'll be fine with me. Um, you know, we get a lot of questions about kids and pregnancy and health equity, which is a big issue, um, and messaging and some some vaccine hesitancy. So certainly happy to, to answer any of your questions. I'm going to turn it back to Carissa, um, and we'll go through the questions one by one. Great, thank you. Um, so first question, the CDC recently provided guidance that small groups can gather if all parties are, are, are vaccinated and they can gather unmasked, no social distancing. Um, does this include children because they have not received a vaccine? Uh, Dr. Parrish, do you have thoughts on that or then I can, I can address it? Um, so yes. Um, so yeah, children are not um, yet eligible for the vaccines. You know, the vaccines are being studied currently in children, um, and it it may be some time, especially for younger children, to be vaccinated. So um, so the CDC recommendations um, talk about vaccinated individuals. So it would be um, related to adults. Yeah, you know, if you have children in the um, in the household, if you are meeting another household they would still be recommended to wear masks just as they're recommended to wear masks outside or in school or other settings. Okay, great. Uh, the next question, for those that have received a vaccine, is it still necessary for them to quarantine after say travel overseas? Um, I'll take that, uh, Carissa. The uh, the general guidance on those, and this is good news, This we'll, we'll see this probably change over time in a positive direction. But for those that are vaccinated who have had a potential exposure, they no longer need to um, quarantine a as you were before when you when you had to be vaccinated. Now, international travel, there may be some specific rules depending on the state where you are and, and the country from which you came and any airline regulations. But in general, if you've been vaccinated and you get exposed, you don't need to to um, quarantine yourself um, as you were before, unless of course you develop symptoms, and then you need to treat yourself as if you're as if you're a case. Okay, thank you. Um, for those of us receiving the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, is it actually a vaccine? I've actually taken I've actually taken both Pfizer shots, but my family has not yet. What is the likelihood of contracting COVID and passing it on to my family when I come home from work? that. So if you've been fully vaccinated, meaning that you've received both doses of either Pfizer or Moderna um, vaccine, the and and you've and it's been about 14 days after you've um, received that second dose, you know, basically given time for the vaccine to um, stimulate your immune system. At, at that point that you are fully vaccinated, um, the studies have have shown that you are there's a negligible likelihood of you spreading um, COVID-19. And we're getting more and more um, encouraging news 
as these vaccines are being rolled out in terms of not just their effectiveness in terms of preventing um, symptomatic or severe disease, but also in preventing uh, asymptomatic disease and, um, and spread of COVID-19 from, um, from person to person. So if you are fully vaccinated, um, you, there's negligible risk of spread of COVID-19 from you. Thank you. Um, at what case rate level can we resume normal life? Uh, Dr. Lankow first, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll weigh in also. Sure thing. So I wish there was a magic number. We have this conversation with clients regularly. Um, what we have done is we tend to look to the CDC guidance and what states are doing to get a sense of what the thresholds are that folks feel are appropriate for moving to different levels of activity. Um, and those thresholds have been quite variable. So there's not clear guidance on an exact magic number where we can get back to normal. What we can tell you is that for our clients, we have been looking at a range of about 100 to 150 14-day case rate per 100,000 as a starting point for discussions of moving from mandatory telework and phase zero into a phase one situation, which is a very low density occupancy. Um, and we've been looking at below 100 as a potential place to start talking about moving into slightly higher occupancy, 25 to 33% range. Um, those numbers come from compiling all the guidance that's out there through CDC, looking at schools, um, you know, pulling people back to work when their children have nowhere to go would not be a kind thing to do to employees. And so trying to align with that school guidance and make sure that kiddos have a place to be and that can, they can be safely in school. Um, and trying to align with risk tolerance of our clients in terms of the activities that their employees do, the population that they serve, and, and other factors that play into this like public transit and how people get to work and so on. Um, so there is no magic number. Uh, and likely COVID is going to be with us for some time as we move towards more and more of the population being vaccinated. Moving about safely is going to get easier and easier knowing that if someone is exposed, they're less likely to get very, very sick and die. Um, so there, we're still watching the guidance, and I think CDC has really stepped to the front in providing that guidance, and they're putting more and more guidance out each day. And so we are really following the data closely and working closely with our medical partners to, to figure out what's safe as this develops. I wish I had a clearer answer for you, but you know I think we really have to follow the data. It's the North Star, and the data are moving very quickly right now along with the guidance. The next question, what do you expect to see in the states that are reopening and in some cases dropping their mask mandates? You know, that's a very interesting question, um, and I think it's something we all worry about. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing pictures from spring break in Florida and Texas. Um, we know that some states have dropped their mask mandates, and we have very good evidence, about as clear as it gets, uh, that that mask mandates work, and that if people would wear masks, they might actually be able to congregate a little more and be a little closer um, and see each other a little more, but we've not been great as a population at doing that. So. It is would not be a huge surprise if in a few weeks in areas where people are congregating more without masks, we saw an increased case rate, and that would be a shame. Um, we won't know that till it comes. We won't remember. We don't test everybody, so we won't won't have perfect uh, information. But right now, we're seeing, as you saw, Dr. Lankow's curve, and she pointed out, um, there's a flattening now. It's not coming way down. It's flattened at a level that is similar to September. Um, that in any other circumstance, we would have considered completely unacceptable from a public health standpoint. So we got a long way to go. It would not be a surprise if we see some some bad outcomes from from really lack of mask wearing in many places. OK, and what, if any, guidance do you expect HHS to issue that states to businesses with regards to people proving that they've received the vaccine and aren't subject to measures such as quarantine or other restrictions? Uh, I'll start with that one. Dr. Parrish may have some thoughts on this from a, particularly from a state public health standpoint. You know, the, the term vaccine passport has been passed around. There is no such thing. Although in Israel, um, there are cards uh, of some description that you can use to prove you've been vaccinated to get into some places. It won't be a surprise if airlines maybe require this or other workplaces. And we've actually discussed this possibility with some of our clients. None of, none of them, to my knowledge, have decided to use them. But you know, in the, in the uh, public health uh, leadership um, at many levels 
um, there are discussions of of is this going to be a requirement? It may well be that some sort of proof of immunity is going to be important, at least for access to certain things. Dr. Paris, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I would just add that, you know, similar to kind of the yellow cards for yellow fever, I think that's probably the um, the most accurate comparison. Um, there may be, um, you know, some kind of a vaccination um, guarantee or vaccination passport um, that that may be in use at some point in the future. Um, at this point, I mean, it remains at this point, it remains to be seen. Um, we're, we're still at the stage now where we're, you know, um, really um, trying to get to a level of vaccination that is that is going to be impactful in terms of, you know, controlling the, the spread of this um, of this outbreak. So um, so I know that there's discussions ongoing. Um, you know, obviously there are a lot of different factors at play in, in, in terms of, you know, um, you know, privacy and, and legality and things of that nature. So um, so there's probably more to come on that. Thank you, Dr. Parrish. Um, is it beneficial for people to call local pharmacies to volunteer or for extra vaccines that might otherwise need to be thrown away? It's another interesting question. We we hear about this. Um, we don't have incredible data on it, but we hear about it. Um, and, you know, actually, I, I haven't seen it, but I've heard there's actually an app for that, not surprisingly, to try to find where uh, where doses may be available. And I know this has happened in grocery stores in the District of Columbia and in other places. And frankly, you know, we don't want any vaccine you wasted. So pharmacies do have this available. Now, I wouldn't necessarily call them. They are, you know, overwhelmed with work right now. Um, so that, you know, I wouldn't suggest calling them, but going there and waiting or using the various information sources, it's a way to get a vaccine and, and they don't want to waste them. And, you know, we want everybody to have it in their arms. So, Dr. Parrish? Yeah, I would, I would add that, um, you know, most places um, have, have a standby list for those extra doses. So, um, so the Moderna vaccine comes in 10 dose vials. And depending on the vial, sometimes you can get an extra dose out of that uh, 11 doses. And then the Pfizer vaccine comes in five dose vials and frequently, in, in fact, now they just state a six dose vials because you can get a six dose out of, out of that. Um, what, um, so what we're seeing now is that as more and more places have um, access to vaccine, there may be um, more no-shows, uh, you know, if somebody had scheduled somewhere else and now was able to get another vaccine quicker um, without, you know, and then they didn't, uh, they didn't cancel their appointment. Mm -hmm. um, so there may be kind of extra vaccine at the end of the day, because once the seal is broken on each of those vials, all of those um, doses need to be used. So as Till mentioned, you know, if you can, um, you know, find out how they, um, you know, kind of, you know, set up their standby list. That's that's definitely an option, and and oftentimes, you know, they're eager to um, give anybody, you know, that that shows up the vaccine. So definitely, we don't want to waste vaccine. We want to get every dose in arms. Thank you. Um, how do you explain the safety of vaccines to people who aren't sure that they want to get the shots? Dr. Parrish, you want to take the first shot at this, so to speak? <laughs> sure. So I think the first question I would have is, you know, what is their particular concern? You know, different people have different concerns. Um, and, and to really kind of address some vaccine hesitancy, you really need to get to the crux of, of what that, that person's concern is. Um, so, but in general, you know, I emphasize that, you know, these vaccines have been meticulously studied, you know, in, in you know, tens of thousands uh, of people, now hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, at this point, they've been given to millions of people. And, and I try to reinforce that, um, in spite of what some might think, you know, th it wasn't rushed. It was just that things were were done instead of being done sequentially. There were uh, there was 
that things were done simultaneously, things overlapped. So um, I have this conversation with patients, um, not infrequently. Um, and again, each conversation is kind of individual to that, that person who's asking the question. So tell, yeah, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, that's, that's great. And those are important points. And I think, you know, you certainly had the opportunity to talk to patients about this. And I've talked to some myself and I've also talked with a lot of our clients and a couple of the things, the, the important thing as, as Dr. Parrish pointed out is to find out what the concern is. There is undoubtedly a small proportion of the population that just won't get vaccinated almost no matter what you tell them. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't get into an argument with people, but certain, there's people who just don't either want this vaccine or any vaccine. But what we really need to do is work on the ones in the middle between the ones who are chasing vaccine and trying to get it as fast as they can and the ones who want. And there's a large proportion that we really need to get vaccinated. People do have questions about the technology, the messenger RNA technology. Um, it is actually, this is not the first use of it. It's actually been, um, and I think people forget that, it's been tried in multiple other vaccines, although it hasn't worked as well. It's just remarkably working really well in this one. Um, and it actually has been developed for cancer immunotherapy. So this is not the, a brand new development. And I do tell people that, that part of this is a tribute to how fast technology and science is moving now, um, as opposed to older vaccine development. People are also concerned about side effects. They hear about the side effects and those side effects are real. Um, they are not particularly dangerous. They can be uncomfortable. Um, and people develop chills the night after and muscle aches and, and usually for about 24, 48 hours, although not everybody gets those. And we just need to be open and honest about those, but those are not causing hospitalizations and are not particularly dangerous in, in, the, in, 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 in many, many cases. And the CDC is following these any the adverse events uh, quite closely. So it's quite safe. And then, you know, I think we just need to, you know, say this is really a tribute to to good science um, and, and continue to be positive about this, but, but continue to watch for for any adverse effects. OK, the next question, are there variants, are the variants leading to increased rates of infection among children? Dr. Lankow? My short answer is I don't know. Um, I don't think we have enough data to be certain at this time exactly how variants are affecting transmission. And, and I, part of that is because there are so many things that push these curves around. Um, we are seeing changes in transmission patterns right now, this flattening, this plateauing that could be due to both behavioral changes and new variants that are popping up uh, in various locations, either because they've come from the countries where they originated or that we're seeing new variants developing locally. Um, I, I don't know how much has been studied in children at this point in time um, to be able to speak to that, but it's something we can look into for you. So the next time we chat, we can give you some updates on how variants are affecting kiddos. I'll say that um, the surveillance for variants is, um, you know, it's not comprehensive, unfortunately. And, and sometimes, you know, in pu where, where I work in public health, you know, if we, um, have, if, if a lab suspects a variant, you know, we're tracking down that original specimen to get it sent to the state public health lab or CDC to, um, to determine. So, um, so it's, there's not really a comprehensive system in the U.S. to really um, track um, some of this in real time. You know, a lot of times we're, um, we're following, you know, some trends in the data and then, um, and, and basically working backwards from that. So, so that said, just as Emily um, stated, you know, we probably don't have enough data to know um, if the variants are contributing to um, increased cases in children at this time. And one other point on this, this is a very specific and very good question that we just don't have the data to completely answer um, as, as our, my colleagues have said, but one important thing to remember about variants is the is part of the reason why mutations and variants happen is because of transmission from person to person and increasing transmission increases the opportunity for for mutations and variants. So if we want to slow those down, we need to stop transmission and the way to stop transmission is masking, distancing, cleaning and now vaccines. So that so getting this to stop moving around from people to people is going to do a lot to eliminate mutations and variations and variants. 
And I think Dr. Parrish, you might have already addressed this, um, but what do you specifically think about the blood clot, blood clot concern with the AstraZeneca vaccine that has been put on hold in Europe? If you could just repeat that, please. Yeah, so, um, so again, the, there were about 30 cases of blood clots um, in patients who have received AstraZeneca vaccine and out of about 17 million people having received that vaccine. And if you think about the general population, like how many people out of 17 million get blood clots, you know, actually that number is probably a little bit higher. It's definitely comparable. So, um, so I think that, you know, I think it's, you know, almost a consensus within the scientific community that, um, you know, holding the AstraZeneca vaccination in Europe was short-sighted at best, and, and it could be detrimental, you know, to the um, confidence in this vaccine. When, of course, we know that, you know, things happen to people and it's not necessarily related or caused by the vaccine. So, again, you know, they're studying it, which is, which is great. And, and as I said, the European Medicines Agency will come out with their findings sometime later this week. Um, but, um, but again, I think, you know, the, the way that it was handled was, um, was unfortunate. Okay. Um, and is there, is there any benefit for women who are pregnant or nursing to get the vaccine? Do you suggest that they should still get them? Yeah. So always I recommend that they talk with their, um, their health provider, their OBGYN. Um, we know that um, many pregnant women have received vaccine and, and vaccine is, um, and pregnant women are recommended to receive vaccine with the updated guidance for the, you know, for the benefit of preventing COVID-19 disease. So this is really a risk benefit um, discussion. Um, you know, I, there are, um, there are people who are pregnant who, you know, work in high, higher risk situations, whether they're nurses, whether um, they're, they have to interact with the public. And when, and we know that COVID-19 disease in pregnant women um, is often more severe. So, um, so because of that, and because of, you know, the safety that has, um, there's still ongoing studies, um, but many pregnant women have already chosen to receive the vaccine. So we have some real world data um, and that's being monitored. Um, the recommendation, the general recommendation of the CDC is that pregnant women may receive the vaccine. Of course, we always advise, um, we advise consultation with their provider. Thank you. Um, I think that is all we have today. Till, do you have any last statements? Yeah, I do want to uh, thank you, and then I'll turn it over to Grish for, for final thoughts. But I, I do want to thank everybody for joining. This is obviously a rapidly changing landscape. I want to really thank Dr. Parrish and Dr. Lankow for taking the time to, to share this important information. Um, and we're happy to answer questions at any time, not just during the town halls, but if things come up, even kind of uh, unusual things or things you've heard um, and you want some clarification on, feel free to reach out to any of us because, you know, we want to do uh, what we can to really to really serve you and serve public health and really get the right information out and address things as they come up. So we'll continue to work uh, with with everybody in leadership and uh, and with our public health team, which is not just the three of us, but a much larger team. Many of the names you see here on the list. Um, to try to support you and get you the, the best information possible. And, and I would encourage you continue to, to for you and your families and your friends, uh, continue to encourage mask wearing and, and good, good social distancing and good public health behavior. And, and we would all encourage you that, that um, to be vaccinated, get your family and friends vaccinated because we're all gonna be better off as more and more people get vaccinated. So there is, there is hope on the way and, and good news on the way, and we want to keep heading in that direction. Grish, any final thoughts? Well, so let me add my thanks as well to you and, you know, our outstanding public health team for the information and invaluable insights that you guys have presented today. 
I hope the information presented will help you and help all of us make informed decisions as we still have a long ways to go navigating through this uh, pandemic. It pleases me to say that I guess we're now able to see some light at the end of this long uh, and arduous COVID tunnel, but we still do have ways to go. So please do the right thing. Take proper precautions with you, your family, and others around you to stay safe and healthy. As Till said, we will continue with these uh, sessions on a monthly basis to provide you know, invaluable information to our employees that we can share with our family and friends. With that, stay safe, stay healthy, and good afternoon. Goodbye.